Hi, I'm Dr. Raj, and today's theme is going to be the differential diagnosis of shortness of breath in a patient with scleroderma. Are you ready to go beyond the pearls? Here's the vignette. We have a 56-year-old female is evaluated for a four-month history of progressive fatigue dyspnea on exertion, she does not smoke cigarettes, good job, denies chest pain, palpitations, dizziness, or syncope. She has a 12-year history of limited scleroderma. Screening cardiopulmonary evaluation three years ago was totally normal. She has a history of GERDs, and is anyone out there surprised that a patient with scleroderma may have GERDs? I would say no. Scleroderma definitely affects the esophagus. Quite commonly, they present with what? Dysphagia. And patient has Raynaud's phenomenon. Is anyone surprised? No. Raynaud's not pathognomonic for scleroderma, but highly associated with. And she has intermittently developed ulcers on her fingertips. Her medications include a calcium channel blocker, probably for her what? Raynaud's phenomenon, omeprazole, which is a proton pump inhibitor, probably for that GERDs that she has, and she uses a little nitroglycerin ointment, once again, for that Raynaud's. On exam, she's a febrile, normal, tensive, non-tacky, non-tachypnic, and the cardiac exam reveals a very loud S2. What does that mean? It means that that pulmonic valve is closing later than the aortic, especially on inspiration. What could be causing that? Let's keep on reading. There's also a fixed splitting of the P2. And what is my differential diagnosis for that? Did, that? did I hear you correctly? Did you say ASD and VSD? Outstanding, you guys are on top of things. So as long as they're clear to auscultation, the abdominal exam is unremarkable, and sclerodactyly is present, and pink scars are visible over the several fingertips. Stop right there. Number one, look at that picture I provided. That is classic sclerodactyly. And if I were to ask you, what is a very quint essential examination you should must perform on patients with scleroderma? It's always gonna be looking at the capillary nail fold beds of the fingertips. Why you look for distortion of those capillary nail fold beds. Let's keep on going. There's no peripheral edema that's present. CBC and ESR is normal. The EKG shows evidence of right ventricular hypertrophy and the chest x-ray shows no infiltrates. Oh! Pulmonary function test, my favorite. What do we have? The FBC is 84% predicted. The FEV1 FBC ratio is 80% predicted. And the DLCO, diffusion limited carbon monoxide, is low at 44%. Which of the following is the most likely diagnosis? I have to say, I'm loving this question right here. So who out there thinks the answer is gonna be A is an apple? atrial septal defect. Well, why did you say that? I know, that fixed splitting, huh? So why is the answer not going to be A? Because what will the DLCO be if you have an ASD or VSD? What did you say? That's right, it should be elevated. Because more blood flow will go from the left side of the heart to the right, going to the pulmonary arteries, more blood means more RBCs. More RBCs means more hemoglobin. And when you give carbon monoxide, who picks it up? The hemoglobin. So it should be elevated, not low like 44%. But good guess. How about B, interstitial lung disease? Do people with scleroderma are predisposed to interstitial lung disease? The answer is definitely. Any type of pulmonary fibrosis will be there, but why is the answer not B? Number one, back to the vignette, test taking skills, look at that chest x-ray. It was normal. And if you really wanted to call those PFTs a restrictive lung disease, what do you need? That's right, total lung capacity. So it's not B. Is it gonna be C, left ventricular failure? Probably not, why? Do you remember that EKG back in the vignette? it said signs of what? Right-sided heart failure. So, by process of elimination, we know the answer is gonna be D, pulmonary arterial hypertension. And let me ask you this, are patients with scleroderma predisposed to P, 
A, H? The answer is definitely. So look at my Beyond the Pearl slide here. Anytime we think about scleroderma, I put them in two broad categories. Number one, is it going to be localized scleroderma where the, you only have skin findings? One of the classic skin findings is what we call morphia. Or is it going to be what we call systemic sclerosis? Those are all the questions on your exams. And systemic sclerosis has two broad categories. Is it going to be limited? which we commonly call the crest syndrome, things like calcinosis, Raynaud's phenomenon, esophageal dysmotility, sclerodactyly, and telangiasias, or could it be diffuse? And how do you really know if it's gonna be this limited or diffuse? You need to do something called a skin score to say how much involvement of the skin do you have? Because both diseases can affect every single organ in the body. And let me ask you this, what is my favorite serological screening test when we talk about scleroderma? The answer should always be ANA. Tell me what the pattern is, tell me what the titer is, and then order specific antibodies. And historically, if you have limited scleroderma, what is my specific antibody? That's right, anti-centromere. If you have diffuse, what do we think about? Ah, anti-toper isomerase, SCL70. You guys are just on board with these things. And remember, scleroderma has a lot of lung involvement, aspiration from esophageal problems, medications that can cause problems, opportunistic infections, and don't forget pulmonary fibrosis and the theme we have here today, pulmonary arterial hypertension. I hope you liked this case. For more information, you gotta go to my website, beyondthepearls.net, and check out my book series. What a surprise, the name is Beyond the Pearls.